Welcome to this special 5x15 event, and we're thrilled this evening to be joined by Robin Ince, one of our great friends from 5x15, and he's here tonight to talk about his brilliant new book, The Importance of Being Interested, in conversation with the one and only Pippa Evans, a comedian, improv performer, author, and co-founder of the Fantastic Sunday Assembly, which you will have heard about at 5x15 a few years ago. Robin is co-host of the award-winning BBC Radio 4 series, The Infinite Monkey Cage, with Professor Brian Cox. He also co-hosts uh, the podcast, Robin and Josie's Book Shambles. And he's on his incredible 100 bookshop tour right now. And we're thrilled that he managed to squeeze 5 by 15 in, in the midst of all of it. So don't forget to pick up a copy of the new book, which is out now. And I know our independent book partners, uh, New and Books, would be delighted to help you. And Stephanie's going to put the details in the chat. And please don't forget to put your all important questions for Robin in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screens. And I know Pippa's going to try to bring in as many as she can towards the end of the hour. So for now, I will disappear into the virtual wings and say a huge thank you to Robin and Pippa for being with us and welcome and over to you, Pippa. Thanks so much, Daisy. Hello, everybody out there uh, in, the, in the world. Out, we can't see you. We can't hear you, but we know you're there. Um, we're really excited to be here and I am thrilled to be talking to my friend, my friend, uh, but also the comedian uh, Robin Ince about his brilliant book, uh, The Importance of being interested. It's actually written the right way around. What you're seeing there is, is, is a mirror image, which I'm sure Robin would be able to explain uh, better than I can. Uh, Adventures in Scientific Curiosity, which Robin, I have actually read cover to cover. Uh, unlike, you know, sometimes we do these things and you, you flick through and hope for the best. But I really, really enjoyed uh, reading this book. Um, so really, honestly, Robin, the first question I want to ask is, is why did you want to write it? Because when I read it, what was fascinating to me was I could really hear your voice in it. Uh, and it, it, it's so full, like it's so full of information and also humanity, which I think is a real uh, thing to do. But also I can really hear your voice. Like it really feels like Robin had to write this book. So what made you write this book? That's interesting. It's such a battle, isn't it? If, when you turn something from being stand up or live performances, you know, you do as well. And that bit of then how can you translate it? So because what I am on stage, if I actually manage to put that in book form, people would just think this makes Finnegan's weight look totally comprehensible. It's um, it, the real drive behind it was, I think that over the 20 or so years that I've been doing shows with some kind of scientific bent, very often people would say to me, oh, I don't really do science. I don't have a scientific mind or say they were kind of scared of, of some of the ideas and I'd often get asked as well by journalists they'd kind of go you know but how can you do comedy about science what's there to be funny about and I would just say with well, the whole universe both real and sometimes imagined and uh, conjectures about other forms of possible laws of physics and life so it's, it's kind of everything you'd have to be fair and they go oh okay yeah that does sound like there might be something there and uh, and so I wanted to and, and I do also I mean the more that I wrote it because I like a lot of things I do I start off with a basic idea I just wanted to invite people in and kind of say there's loads of brilliant things in the world of science and I think you'd like them and then the more I wrote it the more I thought about how many different ideas connect us because I think there's been a thing which is certainly in the 19th century there was a sense that science disenchanted things and disconnected us to things Whereas now in the 21st century, I think it's so clear that really it's, it's the opposite. The fact that all of us have some of the same chemistry in us, as is in yeast, for instance, suddenly, and in everything else, you know, this is, this connects us to so many, you know, all life. And the fact that, you know, whether it is that great line by Carl Sagan at the beginning of, of, of Cosmos, where he stands on a cliff and he says, you know, the cosmos is everything there is, is everything there was, and everything there ever will be. We are all made of star stuff. The stuff of us is the stuff of the stars. And when he says that, I mean, that's a lot to unpack. And, and so I wanted, I also, I wanted to find as many ways as possible of people not being scared. Like one of the things that, um, when I do shows with Brian Cox, quite often afterwards, we just watch the tweets. We're interested to see what stick to people, what certain ideas, because it can sometimes change night by night. And one of the ones that we most regularly get is someone saying, I feel so insignificant because they've never heard about 
how big the universe is. I mean, I, I remember for me, when I was about eight or nine, there was a, a, a short film called Powers of Ten. And it would start with this, this Canadian couple on a picnic blanket, and then it would go out by an increasing factors of 10, further and further across the universe. And then it would zoom back in on them. And then we'd go inside them, molecular, atomic, etc. And I remember finding that really shocking, you know, uh, and I remember it did make that even now, sometimes I can be in a room and I can almost feel like the walls on all sides just suddenly drop down and then the camera starts panning out and you get smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and so I wanted to deal with sometimes those initial and I think quite understandable fears. And so when people would say that, I would start to kind of engage with them, which I think was one of the places where this book really started and say significance is not about size. Everyone watching this is considerably smaller than Jupiter, but everyone watching this is considerably harder to explain than Jupiter. Everyone watching this is, it is easier to explain a gas giant than it is to explain you or me or everyone else watching. And, and then once you start to deal with those kind of ideas, I think people think, oh, maybe I'll have a little bit further looking. I'll have a little bit, I'll look at a bit more of the science. Well, so that's really, I find that really fascinating that, um, that people worry that they're not, that they, they, they feel insignificant. Whereas my personal experience was sort of a sense of relief, actually, to realize how insignificant I was. And I remember actually going to a Q&A with Barbara Dixon. Uh, and uh, she said she likes to go on holiday to like a tiny Scottish island every year so that she can be reminded of the tiny grain of sand that she is mm. so she can be and I, and I really love that idea so I find I find it um really exciting to be insignificant and yet that's what I think you deal with in the book really well is the idea that you know you you can still be interested in in this enormity that is the life life the universe and be curious about it perhaps perhaps we don't have to grasp all of it. You know, you, you talk about curiosity. Um, and, I, and I wonder what, yeah, what would you say to somebody who goes, who goes, I can't comprehend quantum physics. Do we all need to understand quantum physics? No, no. I mean, this, I think this is one of the problems is that sometimes people start beating themselves up. You, you read a book about quantum mechanics and you don't understand it all. Now, first of all, if you did, that would be very sad for the author who's probably spent 30 years studying in a lab and has somehow managed to write a book that you've read in a week and you understand it all. And, and I think this is one of, especially when you start reading complex, we're not even, you know, a lot of books that are described as popular science, I think because it says popular science, people think they should immediately grasp all the ideas. Now, even though it might be popular and approachable, I think one of the problems that we have is it's like brief history of time. You know, that was the one which is nearly 35 years ago now. Every, oh, it's really difficult. What a load of old rubbish, blah, blah, blah. And the thing was, if that was the first science book you'd read in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, of course, you're gonna, it's going to take you ages. And you, you know, th this idea, I think one of the big problems that we have is the fact that if you're reading books on quantum mechanics or the size of the universe, it's quite hard to immediately draw a picture in your head of the things that are being mentioned. So, you know, if you read about a, a, a Victorian melodrama, mm -hmm. you can very quickly sketch in your head a 19th century drawing room. If you're reading about the Battle of Naseby, we are able to imagine people in that kind of, you know, that period costume battling it because it's on our scale. If you go down to a very, very small world of probability, the terrifying line, which is also very, very beautiful and wonderful, and I think plays into exactly what you're saying, which is both the significance and insignificance that comes from this, is Niels Bohr used to say that there was uh, everything that is real is ultimately made of things that are not real, which is just how much, can, how can you not enjoy? You know, that's fantastic. That's an absolute joy. Equally, he used to have a lucky horseshoe in his laboratory. This is one of my favorite stories. And someone once came in and went, Niels, you can't believe in that, can you? He said, oh, no, 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 I don't believe in it. But apparently it works whether you believe in it or not. And uh, I love things like that as well. But, but I, so I, I think don't feel that you're never going to grasp every single idea. You know, in, in science alone, that it gets more and more specific in terms of understanding. So enjoy the ride. Enjoy picking up on sometimes a little detail. I mean, for me, one of the details that, 
you know, I, I think really changed me and the way that I look at the world was one day sat on a, a train that was stuck outside Oxenholme Lake District Station. And I looked out the window and it suddenly struck me. I've been reading some Darwin and I thought, wow, framed in that window that I'm looking out of is more life than there is in the known universe beyond the planet Earth. So just in that, and then I kept making it smaller and smaller and smaller and still more and still more and still more and still more. And then I thought, well, of course, inside me is more life and a greater variety of life than there is in the known universe beyond the planet Earth. Because as you know, you know, we are zoos. We're this incredible microbial zoo. And those kind of, and, and again, in terms of its significance, I think it's also a constant reminder of fragility and strangeness. How strange is it that there are so many colors on this planet, or certainly so many colors in the way that we experience color. How strange that there are so many different life forms. And yet, as we were saying before, who all have shared parts of chemistry and shared mechanisms within them. That is remarkably strange when you compare that to looking at, say, the vista of Mars. Well, so this is, this is great. And it's making me think of the quote, the Margaret um, Mead quote you use, which is, you know, children should be taught how to think, not what to think. I think I've quoted that correctly, yes. I think. Uh, and, um, and, and that is really important because, because I think so much of our fear of science, and I count myself as someone who has feared science and is often overwhelmed when I start to read uh, fact, facts about science, and I, I just can't quite grasp them, that, that we, we don't quite know how to think about science or how to allow ourselves to not understand it fully. Um, and I think that's where the creativity comes in, which again, you talk about um, in one of the, one of the last chapters, um, that science is actually a creative art. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, to, me, to be honest, even that as a phrase sort of does feel like a complete uh, paradox. I mean, I can't be, I can't be, how can it be creative and science at the same time? Science is about answers. Um, so can you speak a bit more to that sort of to inspire people to uh, be, be allowed to ask questions and um, come up with their own ideas? Well, that's the thing is, it's about answers that create questions. So it's not about dead end answers. It's about, there was a, I, I, I was chatting to uh, uh, the, the guy who wrote the Lemony Snicket books and, uh, and he's, he's wonderful and a very, very entertaining person to talk to. And at one point he said to me, he said, I'm so glad that I was brought up Jewish. He said, because in the Jewish tradition, you're allowed to answer a question with a question. And I think those, you know, that bit, which the, the, the two things which can be very discombobulating for people are, first of all, if you really start being interested, not merely in science, but I think curiosity as a whole, properly used curiosity means you have to hold on to your certainties with a very loose grip because they may well change. The information is changing all the time. If you have, I think that's why very often fundamentalists of all different hues, not many religious, but you know, political fundamentalists, cultural fundamentalists, why they're angry all the time, because they have this cognitive dissonance that has to somehow keep the certainty intact. And that's going to be a struggle. Whereas once you go, okay, I'm, I'm, I need to look at these things doubtfully, but different levels of doubt. You know, it's what we've talked about a monkey cage many times. You know, this idea that science is not about the right answers. It's about the least wrong answers with the information and the technology that we have at any time. So Newton came up with brilliant answers that were wrong, but though they were wrong, they were still more right than everything else at the time. And they were so right that they could still be used to get human beings on the moon. So as wrong goes, it's less wrong than all of those other possible equations in, you know, in the many worlds, you know, different Isaac Newtons, we missed the moon and everyone died. You know, this is, so, so those things I think are important. And then in terms of the imagination, I think it's an important starting point for people to realize that many of the great ideas of science come from almost trans in sometimes actually genuinely transcendent moments. You know, when Joan Feynman, who spent most of her life researching the Aurora Borealis, as well as other things, but her work on the Aurora Borealis was particularly important. She and her brother Richard went to a golf course late one night outside New York and they lay on the grass and they looked at the Aurora Borealis and their first reaction was not, how does that work? Their first reaction was to be immersed in the beauty to look at how strange it is that such a light show can exist within the atmosphere of the planet Earth. And then the next day to go, why do you think that is? 
Why do we see that? And when you see, in fact, I mean, anyone watching this, you can go to Joan Feynman. There's some wonderful interviews. If you look, Christopher Sykes' uh, uh, um, YouTube channel, Christopher also made things like the pleasure of finding things out about Richard Feynman and, and a beautiful, there's a documentary about Miriam Rothschild who did a lot of work into the jump of fleas. Now the jump of fleas is so fast that you can't catch it on traditional film because it's faster than the frames of films. And, and, it's, and when you watch her talking about like, she's got all her rabbits and she's combing out the fleas and then she uses what is it is it formaldehyde i can't remember what it is you know whatever it is uh, that that stuff that you always see in movies like, oh, we're going to kidnap you <laughs> you know that stuff that formaldehyde <laughs> chloroform is it? chloroform that's it thank so you she, she uses a careful amount of chloroform on the fleas just to slow them down a bit uh, but anyway yeah christopher sykes when you watch him uh when you hear his interview with joan Feynman. She was at that point 88 years old. She spent a whole life studying the Aurora Borealis. But you can see that here is someone who now has a deep understanding of why it exists and has lost none of the love for its beauty. In fact, I think she probably has even greater amount of love for its beauty, even though in the other hand, she can hold understanding. So I think that's brilliant. And I love, well, it was making me think of two things. One thing is just the fact that someone could get so excited about how high a flea can jump or how fast a flea can, you know, that is science. So, so again, we often think of science as you have to understand the universe rather than I'm just going to study a fly. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up this stick and I'm just going to look at this stick all day long. It's reminding me of the boring conference, which I'm sure you're a, a, yeah. aware of, which I think is an absolutely brilliant, but anyone, um, watching who, who may not have heard of this it's a conference to celebrate the the boring uh, but of course by celebrating the boring it becomes interesting because people spend so much time giving their attention and curiosity to something it stops being boring uh, some, and uh, someone from their conference came to speak at a sunday assembly once and talked about um all the different colors of milk, right? And uh, put up all these slides of different colors of milk, which of course, when you put all these pictures of milk together, suddenly it's a huge palette, you know, all these suddenly, and, and they're talking about the fat content, the kind of food that the cows are eating, what's making the milk, all these different colors. Um, so, so I think that really speaks to this idea of the curious that we don't have to be curious about everything. It could be something like you say, uh, staring up at the sky and thinking, oh, why is that star moving like that? But also something, whatever it is that grabs your curiosity. Um, well, so I what... love, I mean, I totally agree that bit of, I mean, for me, there's been a recent obsession with, I was, I was touring out in Australia a few years ago and we were going along this very, very kind of you know, flat landscape. And I looked at how big the sky seemed that day and a lot of people say that there's a, one of the reasons Australia has a lot of great cinematographers is because they have such fantastic light but then when I came back to England I was looking at the sky and I went it's really big isn't it it's really <laughs> really big and now I and I can't I can't turn it I, I don't know what it is it genuinely it, I, I'm slightly lost and confused and have a little bit of cosmological vertigo, but in the best possible sense is every day that I look at the sky, it seems a bit bigger than yesterday. It keeps, and I don't know, sometimes I think, is this a portent of doom for my own life? <laughs> and, and, and that bit of once you start a relationship with an object, whether it's milk, whether it's the sky, whether it's starlight, whether it's fleas, there's no way, I think, I think it's very hard to stop that relationship of curiosity. And I think it makes things, I mean, I was so glad to be writing this during lockdown because yeah, there was so much negative stuff that was being, as well as wonderful positive things, you know, in terms of, I was suddenly able to see far more of the more negative things on social media generally, or sometimes see bits of television that I would never normally watch where you have a panelist of people who are paid to make people unhappy with their newspaper columns or whatever it is. And I would watch some of it and go, oh no, I feel, and then I think, Oh, today I'm writing about the possibility of listening to the noise made by extraterrestrial intelligence and how we seek that out. And so I would have, you know, that to me is one of the great reasons to engage with your curiosity, because if it, it can, it really can make you happier. I mean, I was one of one of the things I'll just quickly turn about the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. One of my favorite stories was the the frank drake who came up with the, the the equation drake equation which is all of the different factors that are meant to be for basically uh what we believe a planet needs for there to be life on it and he spent a lot of his career listing out for extraterrestrial intelligence um but when he wasn't doing that his professional job he used to volunteer for a phone helpline which was like the american equivalent of the samaritans and i love that story because here you have someone who what is their obsession their obsession in the most positive sense, is listening. They're listening out for the possibility 
of extraterrestrial life. And then they're listening out in the evening to the definite existence of human beings who are going through pain or distress or need some sense of contact. And I thought that, and then I, when I spoke to Seth Shostak, who is now head of the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, he said, yeah, Frank just always had his door open. He was always ready to listen. And I think that, you know, that way where, because sometimes I think people can say, oh, it's all very well thinking about those things. What about the real world? And I think very often it can change your, for the better, your connection with the real world. When, and by the real world, I mean, you know, the daily day, day human world, as well as the real huge world. Well, you talk about in the book when um, astronauts have gone up into space and seen Earth, they suddenly have this perspective that allows them to come back to Earth and go, gosh, this planet is amazing and beautiful. And of course, we just had our favourite astronaut, William Shatner, come back from, uh, from, from, the, from the space land, saying exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, I can't remember where I was going with that, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's I was, the overview effect. You were going to talk about that, weren't that's you? That's exactly. I was going to talk about the overview effect. Uh, uh, so that the, well, this idea of that, that it can be connected, but also that you talk in the book quite a lot about how perhaps science, for a lot of reasons, people have maybe shied away from science is because they've had it used against them as a way to put them down. So that this idea that actually there's there's a whole new kind of generation of scientists who recognize that actually to, to communicate science, we have to speak to people as humans and listen to their theories and their ideas with actual a wish to listen. So the improviser's definition of, of listening is um, a willingness to change or be changed. And I think that's a really great defini definition of listening. And I feel like that's what science is taking on uh, or perhaps perhaps always had but wasn't wasn't the loudest the loudest way of listening um so maybe could you speak a little bit more to that because i feel like some of the fear of getting into science is the fear of being stupid or being felt uh, being made to be uh, to, being made to feel that you are stupid oh well, i mean i think that's a huge problem with with all of our uh, curiosity is mm. you know as human beings we're so worried about being embarrassed we're so worried about saying the wrong thing and so we kind of you know remain silent you know there's that old thing about uh, better to stay silent to be presumed a fool than to open your mouth and uh, show that everyone you definitely are very silly actually um, and and i think that's an extremely unhelpful yeah completely idea because you have to sometimes, I mean, with all the scientists pretty much that I've worked with, and, and I've met an incredible range of people, I've met very few who have not immediately been, I can ask them a question and they'll go, oh, actually, Robin, that's not really how we view that. Let me tell you what our current, they're so happy to be talking about their ideas. And the ones that I, again, I'm speaking, obviously this is, you know, perhaps selection effect, but the ones that I work with, they, they just want to explain ideas and they want you to be excited by the ideas as well. And and then I've, I've very rarely met people who go, oh, actually I want to be best. You know, in fact, I've probably seen that more in the kind of green rooms of literary festivals, the big high fluting literary festival mm. than I've seen in, in science festivals. Um, I think there's, you know, I think we really need to try and overcome, you know, we, we have unfortunately a culture, as we know, again, from social media, etc. We have this culture where everyone's waiting for someone to get something to get wrong, you know, it's like when Marcus Rashford did all those wonderful things, so much of the press and so many people on social media were going, yeah, but what's he done that's rubbish? And, you know, those are the people to ignore. Those are the people to, who, to me, are of no interest. If your first reaction to something exciting, good, helpful, empathetic is, I bet that person's a hypocrite in another way. You know, because, I mean, that's one of the problems we've got, isn't it? Which is for many, many people are able to cast dispersions because they do nothing. So you can't ever call them a hypocrite because they don't do anything. You know, the moment you do something, the moment you take action, the moment you question something, then you are holding yourself up to possible ridicule, to possibly being wrong. And, and I think, yeah, it, it, to me, that's a very, very sad. And I think the older I've got, the more, you know, I look back at some of my stand up from the old days and I think I'd never do that now because I'm really the older I get, the more I want to kind of just draw people in. And, I, and especially with like stand up and things. And I know, you know, we've gigged together, of course, very recently and you absolutely st brilliant, brilliant. Um, when we were at Reading Hexagon, you, you, it was a beautiful thing to watch the amount of love from that audience when you went on and did your, and, and that to me is when we have so much negativity, I, that's why I don't like edgy stand up. 
Oh, wow, brilliant. We're living in a world where many people are marginalised already, and I decided to pick on those people who are already marginalised. When you actually draw people in, when someone comes up to you, you know, sometimes you might do a gig and someone comes up to you and they tell you their story and their mm. story might be about what they're dealing with and sometimes what they're fighting. And they say, thank you for, it might be, you didn't even know that that joke or that story was going to hit with them. And the feeling is so much better than, oh yeah, I hate them too. What a horrible thing. Thank you, I feel better about my my life. I've been going through a bad time. That's a beautiful thing, a beautiful possibility with the way we communicate ideas. I know I've probably gone way off the point, but I, I think that, I mean, it's one of those things that as I've got, got to find out who I am a little bit more, I do realize that a lot of the things that I write and the shows that I'm trying to make more and more are also me tackling very often negative thoughts. And, you know, so when I can immerse myself in this book, or whatever it was, I also knew that I was arguing with myself. I was arguing with the negative, more depressive kind of person. Well, that, well, that's, I mean, first of all, very honest. And I think that really comes across in the book. Um, and what, of course, it's quite, it's quite thick, everybody. Um, and um, it, was really thick it was meant to be. Really? <laughs> that's half the length. Really? Yeah, lucky um, you. Well, it, well, that's what I, it's, it's, it does. It does feel like you're going, you know, you're going through it and you're going, well, what about this? Oh, and I think about this. And you don't really shy away from anything, do you, Robin? I mean, you cover God, you cover death, you cover racism, you cover um, what is real, you cover aliens, you cover spirituality. Um, and oh, this is something I did want to talk to you about because the first chapter was about skepticism. And I thought that was a brilliant way to open because, again, I feel like um, sometimes we confuse scepticism and cynicism, uh, it, including those of us who might call ourselves a skeptic, perhaps get sucked into cynicism. Uh, could you just speak a little bit to that? Because the importance of keeping this, the skeptic alive, but how a skeptic can actually be a really positive voice to have in your head. Yeah, I should mention, because you mentioned the religion stuff as well, how helpful you were, because I spoke to you. Um, for, Which I completely uh, forgot about. So I was reading it and went, oh, it's me. <laughs> I, I did. I had a moment of embarrassment the other day where I was in a bookshop. When I do bookshop shows, I try and get a load of other books from the, the bookshelf. So I'm not just recommending my book. I'm kind of talking about other people's work. And then the two at the top that I, I went, oh, it's got my name on the front because I gave that person a quote. This still <laughs> looks incredibly egocentric. Um, but it was, uh, yes, yeah, scepticism, I think. And I, and I also think scepticism has, there's different forms of scepticism. And, and, uh, and some of it can be negative. Again, some of it can be to feel superior for people who believe rubbish. And I know as a comic, and I will still do this, there are going to be moments when I'm on stage and I do a one-liner joke, which might mock people who believe what I consider to be utterly ridiculous ideas. But I try most of the time to not do that now, to try and because, you know, Merseyside skeptics are a really excellent skeptic group because what they're trying to do is really go into human minds and understand why people are led to believe things which are sometimes utterly preposterous. I mean, someone asked me this the other day. They said, uh, what would you do about flat earthers? And I said, the problem is it may well be too late then. Because once you've started to believe in something like the earth being flat, you have had to, the cognitive dissonance and the amount of ideas, really hard ideas of, of, of evidence that are right in front of you, that you have now relegated to nonsense to believe that, I think it's very hard to pull someone back to that level of, from that level of cultism. And then as I was explaining that, it made me realize the thing that we need to do, again, going back to listening, is very often people can be led to believe utterly preposterous things because they are not happy. So Marsh from, from Skeptics, for instance, when I interviewed him, he had just been, uh, um, he'd just been to a Flat Earth conference. And he said, you watch so many of the films and they start off with someone going, hi everyone, um, not had a great week. Anyway, and so they start off basically already saying, things are not great in my life, but I've got something I can believe in. And so it, to me, it's like, if we're gonna, you know, one of the things, the skeptic movement, we need to understand how people get misled. And that might mean that we need to, you know, we, we need to be really open to listening to people before they get to that point, listening to people's distress and for also for people to be prepared. Again, that fear of embarrassment. You know, in, in the previous book that I, I wrote, I wrote a little bit, um, well, I wrote a little bit about 
suicide. I'm so, sorry, I should probably be careful. So, you know, just I will briefly just mention this. Um, and one of the reasons that I wrote about that was because I met someone whose daughter had taken her life. And she said, I think there should be more stand up about this, write some stuff. So she basically made me write some stuff about it. And I realized, and there's lots of people doing brilliant work now, and you know, Hannah Gadsby, Josie Long, and on and on and on, people talking about so many different forms of, you know, things that we need to battle. But this thing of just giving people permission to sometimes say the things that are most troubling them may well be start, you know, a starting point to trying to stop people believing the preposterous because it gives them comfortable walls around them. Sorry, that was a very, very long answer. And I don't think it necessarily dealt with what you said, but. Well, no, I, well, I think it uh, was a beautiful answer actually. And, um, and I, I think it is really important because it does, it all comes back to this fear of looking stupid, fear, fear of, of failing as it were. Again, very big thing in improvisation is you have to be willing to fail to, to move forward. If you don't fail, you, you cannot progress. Um, of making mistakes. And I think that's so important in, in terms of rather than laughing at people who have perhaps been taken on by some, when well, they are cults, you know, these, these flat, the flat earth world um, and other, other similar kind of worlds that, but it's so hard to step out of that because once you've declared it to be able to turn around and say to someone, actually that thing I was very passionate about, I've realized is completely wrong. You see it when people come out of, um, religious cults that that to leave the to leave it is to leave your family you know so it's actually to ask someone to leave a belief like that is asking someone to to leave their whole world behind and and step somewhere new so so how can we rather than mock how can we try and instead show a different world and say look there's, there's this other thing over here you're really welcome over here and and i promise we won't make fun of you is, you know, I mean, it's making me think of the bit in Friends, um, and, and what I like about your book as well is you do go highbrow, lowbrow, and there's lots of references there that I really can go with. You talk about The Rock; everyone loves a bit of Dwayne Johnson. Um, but there's that great bit in which I think illustrates actually what you're saying in Friends, where Phoebe um, does will not believe that the, foss, the a fossil that Ross that it doesn't believe in dinosaurs, I think, and Ross keeps coming in with all these fossils and things and trying to say, you yeah, know, you're wrong, you're wrong, Phoebe. And then she just turns around and says, didn't 200 years ago, didn't your people all think the world was flat? And he, and he goes, yeah. And she goes, so is there not any tiny, tiny bit of your brain that will allow you to just, even for a tiny moment, think that you might be wrong? And Ross says, yeah, okay, okay, I, I see your point. And then she says, oh, I can't believe you folded, which is a great <laughs> comeback. But I think in, in that little scene, what she re they really illustrate is that this moment where we can actually alienate people who, who uh, are not agreeing with the scientific research uh, because we're, we're making them other, we're pushing them into another bracket. It wasn't a question, was it? It was just a statement. No, it wasn't. Um, oh, talking of talking of questions, let, though, let me agree with you. Then, yes, I think that was a great scene in Friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to say to everybody uh, listening at home, we've got we're going to take some questions very very soon. So, if you've got any questions, just put them in put them in the the Q and A box. And no question is too stupid, is that right, Robin? Well, it's, uh, that's true. It, uh, that, that's the thing is that I mean, I always I can't remember who defined it before saying the stupid question is the question that gets asked. So, so the questioner can prove how smart they are. So, you know, it's a good example is, you know, with creationism and intelligent design. I mean, the fact that the, if we come from monkeys, how can there still be monkeys keeps being thrown. You just know that that is a person who has no interest in asking that question because they only have to go on the internet very briefly to look that up, to find out about the idea of shared common ancestors and it's over and done with. So you know that that's a question in bad. So I think it's only bad faith questions. All questions that come from, you know, it's like people always make that joke, you know, kids always asking why the sky's blue. Actually, they don't ask it that much from my personal experience, but it's, it was one of those kind of go-to things. And you go, that's not an easy question. That's, that's, there's loads of stuff there. There's loads of, you know, whether it's first of all, understanding the nature of light scattering, whether it's understanding our own ideas of why we perceive things to be blue. There's so many different things to unwrap in even the kind of stereotypical, supposedly easy old questions. 
Well, it's, also, it's a great point as well, because I think sometimes parents or, or when a small child asks you a question, you know, uh, whether it's your child or not, there's a sort of feeling like you should have the answer. Whereas actually, if we allow it to pique our own curiosity and be like, oh, I don't, oh, I don't know why the sky is blue. Let's, let's find out together. So again, to allow the child to come with you on the journey rather than feel like you have to say, oh, it's blue because... Um, uh, because there's um, so it's, uh, um, I did learn this at school, um, uh, light and, um, you know, and then the panic of I, I can't articulate a, a huge uh, scientific um, theory. Um, so, so I think that's a really another place where the curiosity comes in is like allow, allowing people to come with you on the journey of discovery rather than feeling like we have to answer the question. Um, it's before- amazing actually how empowered people are by uh like when i sometimes when when brian cox and, and i are doing big tours and i have you know I'll, I'll be picking questions that people have tweeted in and sometimes there will be one where he goes oh i don't really know that one no i, I don't think and you can just see the whole audience go oh thank god oh <laughs> and and even me like you know totally i mean he knows fun but i was I, i've had a, a show that i was doing the other day and someone asked me something i said I, I don't know. I can tell you where you can go. I can tell you who you, who's a really good person to ask, and I can tell you where you can find these things. But I can't answer that. And someone afterwards came and said, "Thank you very much for saying that." And isn't that a, what a bizarre culture we're in? That, but then again, of course, as we know, in the way that politics is looked at, oh, look at that person flip flopping. If you're not flip flopping, you're not taking in the world, are you? Because actually, if you're taking the world and you, you're being cured, I mean, I think that is one of the, the the problems for a lot of people is that really the more that you learn, the less that you know. You know, it's that famous thing, which is like, you know, if you say, here is the box of things that I do not know. And then I've spent two weeks reading all these books about black holes. So that now means the box of things that I do not know is a little bit smaller, except as I was reading the book about black holes, I realized that there were so many things that I did not know that I did not know. So the box is now that big. And you know, that's the thing is that once you accept that if you are truly curious, you will die knowing far less than when you were born because you are so aware of all of these things. And, and, I, and I genuinely find that far more exciting. It's like when people want there to be a meaning to the universe. Well, that sounds boring to me because if there's one meaning, you just go, it's a bit like, you know, the, when a film has a very definite end or you see the monster and you go, oh, oh, is that it? Whereas that's why I love those films where things are just left hanging or David Lynch movies or, or you know, Beckett plays, whatever it might be, you watch them and you've been given no definite and you can still play in that arena, you know? Yeah, I, um, I'm just aware we're gonna to go to questions very soon, but talking about the, the finite and, and, the, and, the, and the not finite, um, I just wanted to read the beginning of the afterword where you say, it feels a bit brutal to conclude a book with the death of all things and of all the thoughts that have ever existed. Uh, so unlike at the death of the universe, I thought I could add an afterword of sorts, which I think is a great beginning to an afterword because you you do really tackle some big stuff in here. And, and I feel like another title for this book might be um, where we are right now and how we got there and what where we where we might want to go or how we might want to think about it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been as catchy obviously but when you started writing the book did you realize you were going to go into these kind of quite deep philosophical places I don't th I mean I think originally it was going to be a much shorter book that's definitely what the publisher hoped for um and and then I just it was, there's loads of chapters that aren't in there of things that I imagined I would deal with. Because I think originally I was going to deal with why you can find happiness in certain scientific ideas and also other places you can find happiness if you don't believe in some, you know, bigger thing, some, some kind of sense of a God or power or whatever it might be. And then all of that kind of disappeared, really, that, that sense of what the book was. And it did become a lot, as usual, every time that I met someone or read a book or saw an article, I was like, oh, that needs to go in the book. Oh, that needs to go in the book. And, you know, with the moment that when I finally delivered after hacking and hacking away at it, the final version, of course, the first day afterwards, when I'm not allowed to change anything, I was like, that's a brilliant idea. And the book would have been much better having that. And that, well, that thing Karl Popper said was really, really good, wasn't it? Oh, oh that science fiction movie based on that Philip K. Dick thing, that would have been a good rep. Uh, and so... You know, in, in one way, I'd like it to be like that Bjork video. Do you remember that Bjork video where this book starts writing itself and you just see her whole kind of life as it writes out, writes out, and then the book starts erasing itself? I mean, that's what I want to make. I want to make the magic book that every time that people read it, they go, oh, there's some more, well, there's some stuff that's crossed out. 
and there's also a whole new chapter. It's somehow connected to what his mind is doing. Go, oh, there we go. I've projected the things that I wanted in my book to all of the copies now. Yeah, I think I think that will that's the problem with any piece of art, you know, or anything that, that has to be finished when it can never be finished. And you just have to say, this is the moment that it is done. But uh, as you... You'll always be dissatisfied, I think. I mean, that's that's the bit which is, I can't remember if I mentioned it in the book, or it probably doesn't fit into the book. It's probably something else I wrote to someone else. But, you know, Wittgenstein was never happy at the end of his lectures. And uh, there's a lovely, uh, I think I might have used it in my proof, Gully Jimson, who's the, the fictional artist in A Horse's Mouth. Whenever he actually looks back at what he's finished painting, he always goes, why doesn't it look like it does in here? And that sense of not having to beat yourself up and just say, you know what, it doesn't because actually whatever did exist in there could never truly be read. It was a sense of something, not a reality. And once you can kind of start to embrace that, I think it makes things a little bit easier. I mean, it's like, with, I can't remember if we talked about when we were doing that gig in Reading, but like when, when I had a conversation with someone who, who's a kind of expert in ADHD and Asperger's and they said, I think that you have ADHD. And I suddenly went, then I, maybe now I'm allowed not to be as angry when I don't finish the show that I've done in the way that I wanted it to imagined it could be done and maybe I should accept that maybe it's all right just to keep going off on tangents and shaking the things up and going off in all those directions and that you know to be 52 years old and only suddenly get this kind of permission to go your erratic foolish mind may well have advantages to it and maybe you can't build the thing that you believe is what is meant to be built by the parameters of whatever world you're in maybe you can build something else well, there's also something there about trusting an emergent process and um, allowing art to continue to live, particularly with a live show or something. You know, so often we're given the we've, we've written the script, we've, we've shown somebody what the show's going to be. And then suddenly we think, oh, actually, I'm going to add in this 15 minutes about eyeballs or whatever it is. And uh, and someone says, well, well, that's not what you said you were going to talk about. But actually, in that moment, you needed that's what came out. You know, again, in improvisation, we talk about you, you need to be with what is rather than what you thought would be, because so often in improvisation it changes every five seconds you know oh, oh, oh I think this scene's going to be about a, a car park and it turns out to be a medieval castle or something if you sat there going no I'm going to try and force the car park in rather than go okay here we are with, we have to be with what is uh, and I think that's one of the difficulties of something like a book where it, there you ca you cannot although maybe with your science friends you can create the magic book you know let's let's never say never um, but um, you know what, we're going to go on to questions from your wonderful audience because there's so many and they're quite meaty, actually, Robin. So get ready for some meaty questions. Um, I'm going to start with uh, with this one, which uh, is, is a lovely question, actually. Um, can you tell us your most surprising story of scientific discovery? Oh, that's really... Do you know what? The, I think the one that more than the size of the universe or anything like that i think the first time that i started to try and face up to the malleability of time and the fact you know kind of einstein's you know the the, the different speed that you're traveling uh means that you know even though you will experience time the same way whatever speed you're traveling that someone traveling at a different speed that there is a disparity in your watches you know so that your your watch your atomic clock is different at the equator to it is at the north pole and then once you start picking up speed and so those kind of ideas i think because they they there are certain things that you think must be definite and so I remember the first time that I heard about, you know, when you fell into a black hole, that if you looked back out, you would now see the universe moving at an incredible speed that you had never experienced before. You would see, you know, galaxies forming and destroyed. And it might actually end up being so fast that you just see light. And it's, you know, I asked a few scientists, it's not in the book, but I did ask them, I said, how would you like to die if you had any way in the universe? And they said, falling into a black hole, what a show. So I think those kind of things, that they, they do initially disconcert me and then tremendously excite me as well. Time and the, and the, the, the shifting of time, I mean, which I think, again, I feel like most people will have experienced in, in just in yourself when a minute, a minute can be a minute and a minute can be six hours. Yeah. It, it change it changes and it and it and it goes. Here, here's another question for you: uh, Climate change in action is evidently a big problem now, and made more obvious with the COP26 conference happening in Glasgow. Is one of the problems a lack of scientific literacy? 
I, I mean, in one way, I think it's because of the way that we perceive things and we have not. So when someone says, for instance, you know, that the temperature is going to rise by one and a half degrees, we look at it in the parochial way of going, oh, it's a bit of a warmer day. And I think we don't have enough of an understanding of how fragile life is. You know, as I mentioned near the beginning, it's, it's such an unusual thing to have, as far as we know so far, you know, perhaps who knows, there might be certain arms of certain galaxies that are just filled with planets that are all bubbling with life. But the fragility, and so sometimes people will go, oh yeah, but actually it's these natural things, they are the main contributor. And you're gonna know, but that's the thing is, here is the natural world, and you only have to add a very, very small amount, and suddenly that whole thing teeters. So the balance, I think we don't have a very good understanding of how nature balances itself and that you don't have to add very much. You don't have to change very much for life as we know it to be changed or destroyed. So I think in that way, that it's, it's almost, we, we have, it's, it's again, that bit when I was saying about when you're reading a book and you can draw things of your normal kind of day or on your scale, you can draw them in your head very easily. And then if you deal with the subatomic or you deal with the, you know, galactic or beyond, it's much harder to draw those images in your head. And I think in the same way, we, the tools that we use in our mind, the kind of shortcut tools, means that one and a half degrees just doesn't sound like any big problem. Um, and, I, and I do think critical, critical thinking is one of the big problems because we have so many people in the mass media who continue to promote what are sometimes considered to be outside voices or skeptical voices when they're not skeptical, because true skepticism will be exploring all the avenues. Whereas what these, you know, when they used to use that term climate change skeptic, that was actually a climate change dogmatist who was only looking for evidence that would feed their own particular view of, uh, of that world. So I, I, and I, and I do think, yeah, I think we really need more critical thinking. So do you think it's a, a science problem? Or, uh, it feels to me also um, an imaginary problem, an yeah. imagination problem that we can't, we just genuinely, as you say, 1.5 degrees sounds like, like you say, oh, so summer's going to be a war bit warmer for us. Um, whereas we can't quite imagine, we don't have the metaphors yet really for us to actually really grasp what climate change, uh, the catastrophe that it will be. Um, so is, is it something that we could work on somehow that we yeah. could learn to expand our imaginations well we, we also have we have such a small number of people in charge of disseminating a vast amount of information you know very few people own the, the the means of mass dissemination of information which means that we're getting a very unbalanced view and uh you know i mean I, to me one of the saddest things is knowing that as far as I can see, pretty much all the technology that is required to really start tackling climate change exists. In fact, a guy called Damon Gamow made a very interesting film about that when he was feeling depressed about it and wondering how to communicate with his small children. He thought, I'm going to go and make a documentary. And he's suddenly going, oh, but that exists and this exists and that exists. Why aren't we moving faster? Why are we moving so slowly? Why are we? I mean, that's one of the reasons that I pulled out of an event at the Science Museum at the beginning of this year is because I don't understand why the Science Museum in London, one of my favorite museums in the world has so many fossil fuel uh you know uh the companies and uh, then well i spoke to lots of friends of mine who do a lot of research into this and they said the truth is they're not moving at speed mm. and and so i, I think that's what the, the, our reality tunnel is so often made up and plastered with a very limited number of opinions and monetized opinions that exist for many other reasons apart from evidence-based thinking Sorry, that's yeah. very. Uh, you know, I'm, do you know why I'm in a very serious frame of mind? Always ten minutes before I do a gig, I get really serious. And just so everyone watching knows, I'm currently at King's Place in London, and I'm on stage in eleven minutes to do a show. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll we'll get on with the question. My, I'm all worried about going on stage, so everything's melancholy and filled with <laughs> anxiety. Well, yeah, because we could carry on talking just about that question for ages, but we won't because we're, we've got to get you on stage. And this is a great question. UFOs, real or fake? Discuss. Well, unidentified flying objects are real because there definitely are flying objects which are unidentified. Um, my personal belief is that there? I've never seen anything which I think is particularly convincing to suggest that extraterrestrial life has visited us in. I mean, I'm always, again, that's about the reality tunnel. Once you saw in popular culture, a number of different kind of spinning discs, suddenly in the 1950s and on other times as well, 
loads of people were seeing them because they've been given that framework. And, and that to me, is, in the same way, it's very interesting. I read a book which was all about the fact that what used to be UFOs before that was probably seeing angels. We have always seen unidentified objects which carry with them a strange message, whether from gods or whether from extraterrestrials. The framing and the cultural framework of them changes. I love, I mean, as you know, in the book, I, I do talk, my, my favorite of the, the alien interventions is one with no intervention. It's uh, Boris and Igor Strugatsky's uh, book, Roadside Picnic, in which basically the aliens stop off here, don't even notice anything lives, use us as a lay-by, have their picnic, chuckle their rubbish out the window and drive off with no sense of us existing. And, and then what they leave behind, of course, is so technologically advanced that it creates this bizarre, this zone. It, it ended up being made, uh, Tarkovsky made it into the film Stalker, which reminded me when you're talking about boring things, one of the things I love about Tarkovsky is the fact that he said, you know, sometimes you keep a shot for so long that it becomes boring. Don't stop then, keep it, and then it stops being boring if you keep it there for long enough. <laughs> That's how I work most of my material. Um... Okay, and another uh, meaty uh, question, and then, um, then uh, which uh, this I think this is a really good and very important question for now. How can we deal with science deniers such as anti vaxxers? Um, I think the only thing that we can do is uh, we can kind of, uh, sorry, that's someone at the door just saying I'm on in a minute, but I, that's all right. It doesn't matter. We'll be able to deal with that. I'll be out shortly. Don't worry. I'll be on stage on time. Um, the, uh, <laughs> This is ridiculous. Me trying to do 112 bookshops and also doing things like this. I absolutely love it. It's the thing that keeps me alive. Um, I, I think that one thing that we need to know, one of the things is to stop giving them platforms, stop giving them megaphones, don't retweet what they say. If you, if you see something that is kind of, you know, you know, from your perspective of the knowledge that you have, that this is an anti-evidence, ridiculous and possibly dangerous position, put up something that is good, put up an article that is good, do not put up the article that is bad. Do not give them that oxygen, do not help monetize their things. That's one thing. I think a second thing to know is that the situation is not as bad as it looks. I've spoken to a lot of people about this. Things like vaccine hesitancy, et cetera, have not been that bad. Um, that actually what's happened is it looked, and this is true, you know, if you look at the, the letters page of the Times at the end of the 19th century, it was packed with conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theory mindset is something that is always with, excuse me, human beings. And we just, you know, and so, so, but the main thing to do is to also, we need to, it's stories work much better than statistics. So first of all, say to someone, oh, that's interesting. Why do you believe that? So that's the first thing to ask. Now, if they immediately come back with do your own research, then you know they have no interest in this. And you know that actually they believe this from some kind of tribal place or some kind of dogmatic place. Um, if they say, oh, it's from this article, then you go, oh, that's interesting. Can I recommend that this person who's been working in this area? And in fact, there was a lovely story. National Geographic a few years ago did a thing about kind of different forms of science denialism. And there's a great story of a, a, a woman who worked in climate change science and her dad didn't believe it was happening. The exacerbation of climate change due to human action did not believe in that. And she would keep going, but dad, look at this graph, but dad, look at these statistics, but dad, look at this. She goes, no, the bloke on YouTube, definitely. And eventually she one day turned around and she realized what she should do. She went, dad, how weird, how weird that you believe all of these men that you've never met, but you don't trust your own daughter. And that was the emotional impact. And I, and I think we need to look at it from the perspective of stories and emotion. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. I think to just co to connect. To, to find a way to connect um, rather than to eye roll, I think, uh, particularly if it's a, you're, you're with them is, is uh, exactly right. I think that's- Also a lot of the loudest voices are bots or paid deliberately to, don't waste your day. If you see someone that after the third time you've offered a good and interesting piece of, of evidence and they're not taking any notes of it and they're clearly not reading it, stop. Stop trying to persuade them. You could be spending your time looking at the sky, looking at the sky, stars, having an adventure, reading a lovely book, or just relaxing in any way that you want. Don't, don't ruin your own mind and don't ruin your own day by fighting a pointless battle. Well, do you know what? We're just going to give you one last question before we send you off to do your show, uh, which I think is probably going to be the hardest one for you to answer. Um, who is the living scientist you admire the most. And this has been sent in by a uh, Professor B. Cox. 
<laughs> oh, if it has been, obviously the answer is Jim Alkalili. But um, the, uh, I mean, I tell you, someone that I, I, I love the work of Paul Nurse. I mean, the people that I talk to in the book, I, I love Paul Nurse. I love his kind of pugilism and his and his smartness. Uh, Jane Goodall is someone who I think is just such an inspirational figure. And my friend Helen Chersky is someone that I turn to a great deal of time, and I'm always so impressed by the breadth of her knowledge and her desire to maintain kind of fascinated and fascinating. So, I mean, there's, it's a very, very long list. There's many, many people. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, you Thanks must go in- for me on. And thank you, Pippa, because you really were a great help for, in, in writing the book and writing that chapter as well. And oh, it's been really lovely to be on, on doing this today. Oh, it's been it's been absolutely wonderful. We'll pass we'll pass back to Daisy. Robin and Pippa, thank you. That was such a brilliant conversation. We've had so many fantastic questions and comments come in. And I know that Robin is due on stage at King's Place in about two minutes. So I'm going to wrap us up and just say thank you for being with us. Please do join 5 by 15 for our live stream event at COP26 on Friday. We're really excited about that. Congratulations, Robin, on the importance of being interested. It is an adventure in science and curiosity and wonder and in the joy of being alive. So thank you so much for writing. It. I hope everyone will get a copy and thank you Pippa for this fantastic conversation but for now good night bye thanks everyone bye